We have uh, three uh, neuroscientists uh, scientists who are here, and I will call the first one Dr. Justin Brewer of the Center of Mindfulness of UMass Medical. Justin? Welcome, Justin. Great. Thank you. It's great to be here. Let's get started. Now, let's just think of the magnitude of the problem. My lab studies addictions. And if you take two addictions, smoking and behavioral overeating, this accounts in the US for nearly half of the drivers of healthcare, healthcare costs, half of them. Now, you can't cure cancer with blood pressure medications, right? You can't cure cancer with blood, pr blood pressure medications and you can't fix behavioral addictions by holding hands and singing kumbaya. So what we're looking at is, what's the root of the problem? What's the mechanism behind behavioral addictions? And how can we use things like mindfulness to help treat them? So let's go through this together. I thought we could start with why Facebook's like crack cocaine, move on to McDonald's, go on to how Lolo Jones could have won the gold medal, and finish up with how we can all become a Buddha in nine minutes and perhaps quit smoking as well, all right? So that's a lot to do. Let's see what we can do. So let's start with Facebook. How are you feeling? Now, it turns out when neuroscientists at Harvard gave people uh, the choice to self-disclose or to earn money while they scan their brains, guess what they chose to do? That's right, talk about themselves. And it turns out when people self, when they talk about themselves, it activates the reward parts of your brain. The one that this arrow is pointing to is called the nucleus accumbens. The same part of the brain gets, that gets activated when you smoke crack cocaine. And another study showed that you can actually predict the amount of time that people spend on Facebook by the amount that the nucleus accumbens gets activated when they just self-disclose. Okay, I took this picture at the Louvre a couple of days ago. For those of you that aren't familiar with one of the top 25 inventions of 2014, you can buy a selfie stick and take pictures of yourself. I love this picture because the boyfriend is standing there and he's been replaced by the selfie stick. So, so let's go through this together. You're at the Louvre, you think, oh, this is a great picture. I'm going to take a picture of myself and post it to Facebook. This is going to be great. And you think about all the likes that you're going to get and all the comments and how everybody's going to be jealous that you're in Paris. So you take a picture and you post it to Facebook and you get all these likes and it feels really good. And you set, your brain says, yeah, do that again. Well, it turns out that this is one of the most evolutionarily conserved brain processes. It turns out that if you go back to the most primitive neuron system, the aplesia, the sea slug, with only 20,000 neurons, the sea slug learns the same way that people learn when they're taking selfies at the Louvre. Basically, you do something, it makes you feel good, you get an urge to make that good feeling continue, you lay down a memory, and then this reinforces it. You've probably all heard of positive and negative reinforcement because the same thing happens with negative reinforcement. You do something unpleasant, you get yelled at by your boss, you have an urge to make that go away, you go out for a smoke or you eat a good snack or some chocolate, you feel better and you learn, oh, well, if I just eat chocolate, I'll feel better. Now, typical treatments say, well, okay, you just avoid these things. So if you drink alcohol, avoid the bars. And if you smoke cigarettes, maybe you should just eat carrot sticks instead. So you can actually target these pathways. Well, it's interesting, these don't work particularly well. 70% of smokers want to quit. It takes up to six quit attempts, and only 5% stay abstinent at the end of a year. So this is a very, very reinforced process that's very hard. Uh, this behavior is very hard to change. Now, it turns out that 2,500 years ago, the Buddhist psychologists described the exact same process. And they described it this way. They said, things get interpreted by the mind. They're either pleasant or unpleasant. We have an urge for the pleasant to continue. We want to hold on to that stuff. We want the unpleasant to go away. We do a behavior to do, make, that, make those things happen. And then we lay down this self. We get a self-identity. And the problem is that this process get, reinforces itself. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's described as samsara. The literal translation of this is endless wandering because it's just self-reinforcing. And the problem is, with this skewed view, when we start seeing the world this way and we start getting attached to these things, uh, it just goes on and on and on. 
They described this. He said, just as a tree, though cut down, can grow again and again if its roots are undamaged and strong, in the same way, if the roots of craving are not wholly uprooted, sorrows will come again and again. I like this modern-day interpretation a little bit more. Uh, you get the idea. So now on to our second one. Well, the food industry says, oh, evolutionarily conserved process, we can make tons of money. We're actually going to flaunt this. So McDonald's, they're, out of, they're after it. They craft their food for your craving. Uh, Kellogg cereal in the U.S., they now have Crave cereal. And if milk chocolate Crave isn't good enough, don't worry, there's double chocolate Crave. And of course, we all know where this leads. Okay, so on to how we can work with this problem. We start to understand what the mechanism is, what can we do about it? Now, mindfulness has become much more popular over the last couple of years. What actually is it? So you can think of this as paying attention. Okay, we're paying attention, but we're bringing a quality of our awareness to this experience. So we're bringing an openness, a curiosity. We're not saying, oh, I know how this is going to go, or I don't like this, or I want this to go away. We're just going to see what we can do to work with the situation. And mindfulness is at least theorized to come in, and instead of helping people avoid things or substitute actually drive this wedge of awareness in between the craving, that urge to act, and the actual behavior. So let's see if this is actually true. Now, it's been shown empirically to be helpful for a number of conditions, just listing a few here, anxiety, depression, pain. My lab has done some work with addiction, even boosting the immune system, and helping people score better on their graduate record exams if you want to go to graduate school. But how does actually paying attention work? Does it actually help you change these very deep-seated behaviors? Does paying attention just by itself actually do anything? So what we actually do in our, in our smoking uh, treatment is to have people smoke mindfully. That's the first exercise that they get. And the idea here is when you really pay attention to what you're doing, you see what you get. And if it's helpful, you keep doing it. And if you don't, you stop doing it. Here's an example from somebody with her first mindful smoking exercise. She said, smells like stinky cheese. She's obviously not French. Smells like stinky cheese and tastes like chemicals. Yuck. And the idea here is she starts to see what she's actually getting in this moment from smoking. She doesn't have to think about, she knows smoking's not good for her. But in this moment, she sees, oh, this isn't actually as good as I thought it was. So we took this, we did some randomized clinical trials, and found that mindfulness training was actually twice as good as gold standard treatment in the US for uh, for smoking cessation. We had, you know, twice as good. This was on the level with uh, some of the best medications out there. And the effects effects lasted. Um, At our four-month follow-up, they were still largely, uh, they had maintained their abstinence. So this was pretty good. We're seeing a behavioral signal that you can't argue with. They either have quit or they haven't quit. So we ask ourselves, well, what's actually going on mechanistically? And the hypothesis is that if craving is a fire and smoking is the fuel for that fire, if you stop adding the fuel, that fire should be there for a bit, but eventually die down. And we studied this mathematically. I won't go through all the details. But basically, you get a strong correlation between craving and smoking at the beginning of treatment. This is completely gone at the end of treatment. And if you do all the fancy math, it has nothing to do with craving. It has nothing to do with cigarette use. It's the amount of informal mindfulness practice that people do that decouples craving and smoking. And we can even see this in the raw data. If you look at the end of treatment, Same level of craving for the people that quit and the people that don't. And for the people that quit, their craving dies off over time. So that's really interesting. It seems that mindfulness is actually driving this wedge in here. We can see this mathematically. We can see this behaviorally. And importantly, we can start to get at the psychological mechanisms of how it's working. Okay. So then how do we disseminate this? Uh, So training a lot of people to facilitate mindfulness training is expensive it's not scalable so we turned to the uh, technology and we said okay let's develop a an app that can actually deliver this at the point of contact and this is really important because context dependent learning is where people learn to smoke they don't learn to smoke in their therapist's office they don't learn to smoke in the hospital they learn to smoke in their car on their front porch outside of work and so we put this put this manualized training together in 21 days of uh, modules where they can get daily playlists. They can have animations that help walk them through the core concepts. Uh, They can pair this with in-the-moment exercises. And they can even, uh, we can collect data through experience sampling to make sure that it works. We can also pair this with an online community where they have access to me as the addiction psychiatrist, to peers. They can tell their stories. They can learn from each other. We can crowdsource this. 
So I'll just show you a quick video that kind of shows how this all fits together. Welcome to Craving to Quit, a three-week program that will help you quit smoking. This training delivered live at Yale University has been shown to be twice as effective as other quit smoking therapies. Now I'll walk you through the basic idea about how habits are formed. First, recognize that the wanting or craving is coming on and relax into it. It also turns out that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. And so our next, uh, our next app is going to be an eating app that will come out early next year. More addictive than cocaine. Which makes sense because that's how this process was set up, so we'd remember where food is. Okay, so now let's get on to, to what's actually going on in the brain. And I'll start with a story. So Lolo Jones was an Olympic hurdler. She was favored to win the 2008 Olympics. In fact, she was in the finals, in the lead, at the ninth of 10 hurdles. And what she said in an interview with Time Magazine was, I was in the middle of a race, and I, at one point I realized I was winning. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm about to win the Olympic gold medal. It just seemed like another race. And then a point after that, I started to notice that I was telling myself to make sure my legs were snapping out. That's when I hit the hurdle. So I overtried. Now the idea here, it wasn't that she had thoughts, it's that she got caught up in thinking, right? She got caught up, she tripped herself up literally. And it turns out that this is a pretty common process. About half the time of the day, we are actually spent either daydreaming or getting caught up in our experience. And you can think of this as a continuum, daydreaming, stress, and of course, the far end is addiction. And because we do this so much, we can actually study this in the brain. And it's now aptly called the default mode network because this is what we default to. And I'm going to highlight a particular uh, part of the, of the brain called the posterior cingulate, which you can see here in the back of the brain, which turns out when you look at all the data, there are a bunch of different things that will activate the posterior cingulate. When we're thinking about ourselves, when we're mind wandering, when we're uh, thinking about the past and future, judging things, when we're thinking about ourselves in social situation, liking choices that we've made, when it's involved in prevention goals, immoral behavior. I'm just going through this large list. And finally, of course, craving. What do all of these have in common? What does this brain region actually do? The idea is that this brain region gets activated when we get caught up in our experience. And of course, with mindfulness training, the idea is to notice what that feels like and to let go. So let's see if this is actually true. We did a study a couple of years ago where we took novice and experienced meditators and we scanned their brains while they were meditating. And we had them do a number of different types of meditation to see what was common amongst all these different meditation practices. And as you can see here, these two regions, these two main regions of the default mode network are both deactivated in experienced meditators compared to novices. So this was interesting. It was relatively novel. We didn't believe it. We wanted to see if we could actually uh, prove this in more, uh, more thoroughly. So we followed. Uh, this is actually a technique that Christopher Descharmes um, really uh, piloted. Uh, and he'll talk a little bit more about it uh, in his talk. But the idea is we can take real-time neurofeedback to bring the subjective experience together with brain activity. And we can give people feedback of their, own, real, of their own brains while they're meditating. And this is what, the, what a typical graph looks like. And the idea is people can meditate with their eyes open, letting the graph rest in the background. And then they can check in from time to time to see if it correlates with their experience of getting in their own way, as well as um, when they're meditating, when they're concentrating on their breath. And, and our studies show that we have a very good correlation between this graph and people's subjective experience. 
Now, that was a novice. Here's an experienced meditator. Now, I don't, I'm not very good at statistics, but even I can tell the difference between these two uh, people's brains. I'll just walk you through what this, might, what this looks like. Here's a novice. These are three-minute runs. So he says, you know, there's nothing special here, nothing special here, reporting that it was lining up with his experience. In his third run, he said, I don't think your feedback works because I was thinking about my breath, and it was showing, it was going red. Um, I, so there must be something wrong here. In the very next run, his brain looked completely different, and he said, oh, I get it feeling the physical sensation of my breath rather than thinking about it. So he'd actually use this as neurofeedback, even though this wasn't the experiment. Now, I'll just walk you through how we can take these data and, and bring them together so that we can learn even more about what these specific brain regions are doing. Here's an experienced meditator going through the experiment. And after each, uh, this, these are one minute runs now, they're describing their experience. And he said, I caught myself, I was trying to guess when the words were going to end and when the meditation was going to begin. So I'm trying to be like, okay, ready, set, go. And then there was an additional word that popped up and I was like, oh shit. And there's that red spike you see there. And then I sort of immediately settled in, and I was really getting into it. And then I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's describing exactly what I'm saying. And then you see this red spike. And I was like, OK, don't get distracted. And I got back into it, and we got blue again. I was like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. It's doing exactly what my mind's doing. So he was laughing at this point, And he said, so I find it really funny, because that's to the next question. That's a perfect map of what my mind was going through. That's a perfect map of what my mind was going through. So what exactly what was his mind going through? We can take all of these data from all these novice and experienced meditators and bring them together. And in a data-driven fashion, we can figure out what exactly this brain region is doing. And we can confirm what other people have found. So when you're distracted, when you're thinking about yourself, the posterior cingulate gets activated. And you can see that here in this whole line of distracted awareness. But we also found a new category where they were describing controlling things, trying to effort, or when they were discontent, that was something that we hadn't noticed before. With deactivation of the posterior cingulate, again, when people are concentrated, the posterior cingulate gets deactivated. We know this already. But there's this whole other category that came out as well, this effortless doing when people weren't efforting. I'll give you a couple of examples. So this person said, I was worried that I wasn't using the graph as an object of meditation. So I tried to look at it harder and somehow pay attention more to it. And of course, it went red. Harder, ah, pay attention a little bit more. So here's some examples of deactivation. The first one, toward the middle, I had some thoughts which I don't see in the graph, maybe because I just let them flow by. The second person noticed that the more I relaxed and stopped even trying to do anything, the bluer it went. Stopped trying. Ah, Yoda, no, try not. Do or do not, there is no try. So we're getting at this sense of flow. For those of you that aren't familiar with this, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi described this uh, several decades ago as this mental state where we're fully immersed in the present, totally energized, we're selfless, it's effortless, we're just we're just doing it. You can think of um, you know, sports figures like Michael Jordan or, or other uh, folks that are just really in it. And it just seems completely effortless. This is flow. And we even had some examples where experienced meditators were, were reporting getting into flow in our scanner and that this was correlating with decreased activity in their posterior cingulate cortex. So this is pretty interesting. Now, just to finish, um, we can take what we know mechanistically. We can think about the psychological mechanisms behind addiction. We can look at the exact pathways, and we can take targeted things like mindfulness that target the key components of the pathways. So we can target craving. We can help people work through craving so they can literally change these addictions that are so hard to quit. We can take that, we can pair that with delivery platforms like I showed you with the app plus online community in ways that are scalable, that are cost effective, and can help reduce this healthcare burden that the world is feeling more and more of. And eventually, we can start to pair these scalable technologies with uh, neural feedback, where we can give people specific feedback from their brain regions that are associated with mindfulness. For example, we can give them this mental mirror. It's not going to meditate or teach them you know, for them, but it's going to show them whether they're doing it correctly. And what we know as humans is that we learn the most. We learn most effectively through feedback. So these are just some examples of this new era, uh, at least that we're working in, in terms of craving and addiction treatment. So I will stop there, and thank you very much for your attention.